Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us at this Birkbeck School of Law summer term legal practice conversation. And I'm really, really delighted to introduce this evening's guest, which is Her Honour Judge Lynn Roberts. So thank you so much for joining us, Judge. It's great to see you here. Really delighted and looking forward to this conversation about thank you. things to do with judging the law and, and, and family law and whatever questions people would like to ask in the chat after I've had a chance to have a chat myself um, um, with the judge. So I'd like to I'd also like to say a, a particular welcome, uh, not just to my family law students and first year students, but also to any of you here who have been offered a place at Birkbeck and um, might be joining us in October. We really look forward to seeing you um, in October and hope you enjoy this evening's uh, legal practice conversation series. The aim of these events is for us to academics to have a chance to people who know what happens to law in the real world and to see what happens in that conversation. So we'll see how things go. So first of all, a very warm welcome once again, Judge. And I'd like to start off by asking you, um, how did you get into law and what made you choose law as a profession? What was it about law that interested you? Well, we have to go way back to the 80s um, and um, I worked my first job after university and I did a history degree was in um, a community health council, which was a, a kind of they don't exist anymore, but they were a lot to do with trying to get the local people interested in um, involved in their local health service and to make it um, appropriate for that that community. And so that got me very interested in um, people's rights and taking up their rights and all those things. I was rather political. Um, and in the 80s, it was it was there was a real movement of um, legal aid firms who were taking on big so societal issues. And um, that very much appealed to my politics. So I went off after working for the health service for three years and um, trained. So that, that that's what got me going in the first place. Right. Um, and then, um, which is interesting, you uh, were a partner at the law firm Hodge, Jones and Allen, which if to many, I, as a North Londoner, I certainly know, it's a, a very famous Camden Town law firm, but not just a local firm. It does indeed, uh, it's quite well known for bringing lots of those social rights yes. cases. And you know, I had a quick look at the website of Hodge, Jones, Allen today, and on, it's, on the top of the website, it says fighting for rights. So yeah. one of the questions I've got, um, were you always a family lawyer as a solicitor in practice or how did you, what did you do to become a family lawyer? What sort well, of law I was determined not to be a family lawyer and I wanted to do crime. Um, and but things just don't go go as you plan. And I think I, when I was finishing my articles, which was what training contracts were called in those days, I um, somebody went on maternity leave who had a family caseload. So I was given the job to look after that. And the rest is history. I never I never moved away from it. Right. But I, I mean, once I got into it, I loved it. So that's right. how it happened. Mm. What made you th think that you wanted to do crime and hadn't been thinking about family? Well, did you have a perception of what family law was that you... I think just the yeah. thing I think the thing about family was it was seen as that's what women did and yes. that's the reason I didn't want to do it whereas fam uh, crime was quite sexy it was the thing to do it had all the it, it was quite macho in fact I'm quite I'm very glad I didn't do it because it I, I think it, it it did have that image um and I grew up a bit and realized that wasn't for me though it is obviously for some people but um not for me um but family, it became absolutely fascinating to me. So, and there's so many aspects to it. So, it I is have never regretted it. Yeah, it is so interesting how gendered those subjects still remain. Um, yeah, I just came back from an academic conference, and in the criminal justice world, you see lots of men, and then you move into the family law world, and suddenly the proportions are absolutely changed. Yes, and oddly enough, that's that's. For people the generation younger than me and I've you know cut my teeth in the 80s and did my articles in the 80s as well so it's it, it's interesting how that sort of carried on so perhaps we can come back to that in, in a mm. moment so the, you made the big leap from being a solicitor in practice to then becoming a judge and I'm really interested in that move from being a solicitor to a judge it's a totally different hat 
it's a totally different role. What made you want to move from being a solicitor, fighting for justice, bringing cases, defending, not defending people, but acting on behalf of people, yes. defending their rights, to want to be a judge? Did you agonise over that decision? Tell me about the, what, I'm really interested in that move. That move. Um, there's various strands to that. In a way, we were an unusual firm because there was already um, a precedent. I had a fantastic senior partner, Henry Hodge, who became, I think, only the second ever solicitor high court judge. So I had him as a role model and I, I'm quite keen on role models. Um, and um, I did a massive care case, the biggest care case there ever has been. I acted for a woman who had adopted about 70 children over the years. She was basically the lady who, when local authorities didn't know what to do with their most troubled children, they placed them with her. And then, of course, many years later, people started saying, oh, but it was a it was terrible, etc. And uh, so the local authorities started care proceedings because she still had 12 youngsters and many disabled adults. Were they adopted or fostered? Was it? No, uh, they were all mostly adopted. They'd adopt all gone through the courts adopted. Adopt and so it was a massive case. I did nothing else for a year, which is very, very unusual um, in legal aid world. I loved it, but it, I found it was very difficult to go back after that to doing just ordinary work. So I think I, 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 it was read, it was the right time for me to move on. And I'd already started doing deputy district judging and really enjoyed it. Um, and um, I'd also usually specialise in acting for the children in care cases. And if you act for the children, it already makes you think a bit more objectively about the case um, rather than, uh, because you're 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 representing the child and you're you're not you don't get involved in 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 the parents' issues in that way, mm. and I think I felt that was what I was good at, and that led seamlessly into doing doing it as a judge. So, yes, and um, it it was definitely I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being a judge more than being a solicitor. Definitely. Right. Is there anything you miss about being a solicitor? Do you feel less free in what you can say? as a judge than you were as a I mean, you talked about being political. Clearly, that was yes. the question. Well, you're not allowed to be political at all. No. But what, what's count, what counts is, because I've read some of your judgments, they sound pretty political to me, some of them, but I might cook, <laughs> say about that, you don't hold back. So, well, but where's yes, the- Well, not party political. You couldn't be party <laughs> political. I mean, you can't say that there's, you, you're not really allowed to, you're not allowed to say anything about anything that's remotely political. You'd you'd immediately get into diff, into into trouble, basically. Anything that's party political? But well, you're not even, they're, 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 the, the, the higher echelons are very sensitive about talking to the press, for example. Um, and I have done a bit of that. And I once did a quite, this is just shows you the absurdity of it. I did, um, I introduced when I was in Essex, I introduced um, a bring your bring dogs to court as a therapeutic thing, the so therapy dogs, and they made a real difference and they calmed people down. It was it was a great project. And there was a big spread in The Guardian about it. And I, I, I was um, I received a call from a very senior judge, how dare you, etc. But fortunately, I had already got permission from the president of the family division. So I was fine, but um, you see, it was you know you talk to the press. How dare you? Right, right. And yet, and, and yet, I, I've noticed some of your judgments do appear in the press, but that's of course different. That's reporting. Yes. Uh, what's it like when you see a case of yours reported in the case? Because I've noted a few of the cases have cropped up in the Daily Mail, and it, obviously you can't comment if you think they've got it wrong. Absolutely, it's very frustrating if they've got it wrong. Um, Yes, uh, it, it's it's absolutely maddening. I think a lot of judges are frustrated that um, the the the, the knee-jerk reaction from the judicial press office is to say nothing. Um, that's always their advice. Whereas we would often prefer them to speak up and say, well, this is factually completely wrong, etc., or whatever it is. But they that's never the advice. Say nothing. I wonder if I can push you a bit more on this, like this boundary between what's political and not political, because obviously in your current role as the designated family judge in the Central Family Court, 
you're involved with management issues and dealing with grappling with the many demands that are placed on court practitioners, all of the court practitioners. And clearly issues such as legal aid, litigants in person, that day to day has implications for day to day management. And at the same time, couldn't one argue that they're quite political? Well, legal aid is certainly a political issue. And uh, the approach towards litigants in person is a bit political in some way. So can you comment on legal aid policies and the, the impact of legal aid? Uh, not really. You would you would just raise it within your own uh, hierarchy, um, your concerns. Um, but um, and also, although I'm I'm um, I'm not at the bottom of the, 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 the hierarchy, I'm certainly not at the top and, and anything like that is for um, those much higher up than me. So, um, yes, you, you raise your concerns with those above you, but you're not meant to ever speak to those outside the, um, the camp. Do you find that frustrating? I'm what? used to it because I've done it for so long now. I'm used to it. Um, um, yes, I suppose I do. But it's um, as you say, there are ways if there's, some, if there's something you feel pretty strongly about. Sometimes you get the opportunity to put in a judgment and then publish the judgment. But it doesn't come up very often. But you, you sometimes can sometimes. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of wonderful, I'm going to quote back at you a couple of judgments that, that, that you made. With, um, you made an, a very interesting judgment in a divorce case, uh, VWBH, that had a lot of hearing. I think oh. it's probably under the old law, clearly under yes. the current law, which has only just been introduced. And it was one of those exceptionally unusual contested divorce cases. And um, you really went for the husband and all the newspapers supported you on this. He clearly sounded like a really nasty piece of work, really nasty piece of work. And you said that his attitudes were common of 40 years ago and not today. Um, in a sense, you are making a judgment on what, what, what's acceptable within a marriage. And, and um, in a sense, you, you could argue it was sort of quite a feminist judgment in some ways. I hope so. But I think also that one, I definitely was... I definitely saw that as an opportunity to um, publicise the what was wrong with the current, with, not the current, with what was then the current divorce law. And I really hoped it would help the push towards changing the law. So that was a, a, a way of me seizing that opportunity. Yes. Um, but uh, as a feminist, yes. I mean, it, it, his attitudes were absolutely Neanderthal. <laughs> yes, right. it needed saying. It did need saying, partly um, to get it out there, but partly for the sake of that woman. So she felt in some way vindicated. Yes. I mean, the, the, it shows you how arbitrary case law is, because I think if Owens versus versus yeah. Owens, the big Supreme Court case, which was about a contested divorce case where um, ex exceptionally a husband um uh, contested a divorce and really exceptionally the judge in first hearing actually refused to grant the divorce. Now I think if that case had gone to you for first hearing she, Mrs Owens would have been granted her divorce. I don't think I'm saying anything too controversial by saying that. Yeah. And indeed if it had gone to Brenda Hale she almost acknowledges that in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Indeed, Lord Wilson almost acknowledges it in the Supreme Court. If I'd been the judge at first hearing this wouldn't have got there. Yes. Yet because a case gets to the Supreme Court it probably had more weight and more significant exactly. to change the law. So it's curious, isn't it? It's really arbitrary sometimes what gets up to the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. I think I can probably say that um, that judge was not aiming to change the law. Um, I can agree with you that if I'd heard it, if 99.9% .9 of the judges in the country had heard it, she would have got a divorce. But thank goodness that yeah. he heard it because it had now changed the law completely. Yes, yeah. there's something about a really reactionary judgment that can be outrageous. And actually, that outrage is really important yeah. because actually that's what that's what brings about change sometimes. It definitely did. And definitely, I've got no doubt that um, that when the higher courts dealt with it, they saw it as their opportunity. I, I know they did. And uh, they, they knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and it has led to, uh, at last, a good divorce law. Which, yeah, yeah I mean, I've had quite a lot to do with that coming in, and it's it's fascinating. Um, um, 
because one of the things it, it, it's brought in is the ability to jointly apply for a divorce, which is really a big change. Yes, yes. And so everybody listening, there is a brand new divorce law that was introduced. It's about two weeks ago. It came into force the 6th of April, I think. Yes. I told all my family law students this year that they were the last students I'd be able to teach all the adult <laughs> cases to. Yes. Bit, because they're quite fun, those cases. But they it, are. It will, it will now be a more, in some ways, a more civilised legal system, I think. I think yes. most people are quite pleased about that, definitely. I think everybody is, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'll put that to a side. There's lots of other things I can say about that. I want to make a, a, a one of the things I want to talk to you about, and you know, we agreed we'd discuss this, would be how domestic abuse in family courts is dealt with, responded to. In particular, talk about the Court of Appeal case of Re H N and others from 2021, and your role in a subsequent hearing. And I just want to. I'll need to set it up in a way because one of the judges who was being appealed in this case, and this links into what we were talking about before about what a judge can say and what a judge can't say, um, was the case in which you were involved in the rehearing, of course, was uh, Judge Tolson in that case was corrected by the Court of Appeal for saying that the current system encouraged people to make allegations of domestic abuse and cross allegations because partly not just to gain sympathy, but partly because that was a gateway to funding. Uh, and that's that was the statement made. I mean, the Court of Appeal is very clear. They say that he wasn't making a political point, but he did make that point and they corrected him, said that was an inappropriate point yes. to make about that that um, the system encourages allegations of domestic abuse, the making of allegations. Yes. Isn't, um, in some ways, and, and legal aid is dependent, I mean, that is one way you can get legal aid is by making of the allegations. So he was, in some ways, it was a statement of fact in some ways, wasn't it? No, um, I, I think he was, he was putting two and two together, making five, because um, if you're the victim of domestic abuse, um, there's a lower test for getting public funding than um, in other cases. Um, so you're more likely to get public funding. But I do not accept at all that people therefore make up those allegations to get public funding. Yeah, it was a bit like saying to get pregnant to get to get housing lists. Yes, so. exactly. That kind of analogy that... Yes, I think that's a nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And correctly, I think the Court of Appeal said it was really inappropriate yes. for a judge to say, really in a judgment, bearing in mind he's in a judgment, you're talking to the people who are making the allegations as well. That must be well, really... You realise he's the same judge who, in the Owens case. Yes, yes. Yes. He was actually attacked. There's an instance where he was actually attacked by a um, I think one of the claimants or defendants in a case he was involved in. Uh, yeah. Just an aside, there is a real concern about judicial safety and security. Yes. Um, is that something you worry about? Um, I don't worry about it um, on a day to day basis. We have a lot of security and we need it. I mean, there's the our wonderful security chief of security has a massive collection of knives and machetes, which he's removed from people. Wow. Um, yes. Um, so we, they are very, very effective. Um, I mean, he got they got somebody the other day who had um, a broken bottle in her in her pocket. Um, that so I feel I think that they're, they're very effective. Um, Secondly, I think generally they don't want to go for the judge. They tend to want to go for the other party or the social worker. So, I mean, that's I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I don't feel personally um, at risk, though there are occasions. But the worst thing these days is um, the online abuse, which that, that you quite you often you can get as judges. But I think in a way, I also feel that it's quite surprising we we aren't um, abused more than we are, considering what we're doing and the huge uh, decisions we're making about people's very, very um, important family matters. But um, yes, mm. and the family law decisions really impact on people in, in an extraordinary way. And, and that really leads into thinking about this case. Uh, uh, just a bit of background, you know, that the in the family court, domestic abuse the way it, it, it's, it's different. 
is dealt with in a way that's different from the criminal law. Uh, uh, of course, it's not a prosecution. Yeah. It's a question of fact and evidence that's pertinent to the decision you're making, but you're not in the business of prosecuting and convicting and sentencing people. They're two quite separate things. I'm just sort of explaining that to everybody in the in the room who yes. might not be quite familiar with it when we talk about what your role in relation to domestic abuse is as a family court judge. And in the Court of Appeal judgment in re H and N, um, they really set out very clearly why this is an incredibly difficult task. And it really strikes me as a really difficult role. Not only, and I was quite struck by this, um, domestic abuse is, is, is a factor in 40% of, of, of cases in the family court, which is incredibly high proportion. And the judges in that judgment make quite clear there's a tension between if you acknowledge it, you can limit a parent's future relationship with their children. And on the other hand, you expose children and other parents to abuse and you've got to make a judgment on that. And either way, that's, you know, that has a huge impact on people. These are really difficult cases. And I think they talk about it being the um, it's something on a, a day on a regular basis of for the family court. Has it always you've been a family judge for quite a while. Have you seen domestic abuse increase as something that's referred to in the courts? There's definitely. Um an increase in um, the allegations being made in family cases, but I certainly don't think there's an increase in domestic abuse. I think it's always been there. I just think that um, probably as a result of various cases, it's argued more in, and it, and it's people bring it bring it to the attention of the court more. But um, I mean, I back at Hodge Jones and Allen, I think I set up no, I know I set up what I think is the was the first domestic abuse uh, unit in the country. So we had um, a, a little team who just did domestic violence injunctions for women, one or two men, but nearly all women. Um, so I've always been very aware of it. But um, some years ago, it was recognised as so important. Um, as something that will affect children if they've been exposed to it. And so that's become, that led to let many more cases, it being cited in children cases. And then ReHN, I think led to um, coercive and controlling behavior being argued in many more cases. Um, and at the moment um, we have, we have more cases then we can really cope with where it's 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 argued because each case takes its time to get through. And that, as they as uh, as you and the judges make clear in their judgment, is very clear is again an additional tension of delay. Yes. And that always strikes me. I don't know how you get the balance right. On one hand, recognizing you've got to be fair to all the participants, you need to look into it, yes. investigate it, and allow people the opportunity to present evidence, and at the same time, conscious that. Delay is damaging. The longer you go, getting that balance right is really difficult. We don't really get it right, I don't think, because because of the sheer volume of cases now, um, and in particular, so many people in these private law cases aren't represented, particularly the men. Um, I don't think we are getting it right because the the delays are are really very serious now. Um, but. Um, a recent, very recent case called K and K has come out and I think might help us because it's focusing, it was a decision of the master of the roles and um, surprisingly getting involved in family work. But the president and Lady Justice King were also in the case and he's reminded us that in these children cases where domestic abuse is alleged, we really only have to deal with it if it's relevant to the welfare aspects of the cases that we're dealing with. We're not there to just resolve what the issues that have happened in the relationship unless they are relevant. So um, we, it may assist us to focus more on determining domestic violence allegations in those cases where it's necessary to do so. And yet it must be, which sounds great, but I suppose in some cases it's almost like a chicken and an egg. You need to do some investigating to work out whether it is 
Rid absolutely, of, uh, absolutely. I was talking to the justices because not the justices, the legal advisors to the justices today about that because they do the initial gatekeeping in our cases and they're the ones who are making those crucial decisions quite often. Um, and it's very difficult for them. Right. Um, because they're, they're, they they don't have, they, they know vaguely what allegations people are making, but until you really flush them out, you don't know how how relevant they are going to be. So you sometimes have to go down that route to a certain extent, which, you know, takes weeks, and then review it again to see now, are these allegations going to be relevant if I determine them to the right. interests of the children? So that's part of that whole broader move in in the justice system uh, about trying to balance speed with effectiveness and justice. And I think that idea of a triage system, you know, it's a bit like going to the A&E department, yes. get someone yes. to have a look to say, no, that's not that serious. You don't need a doctor or yes, it is. You do need a <laughs> judge. Yes. You know, that, it, that's, they have a big decision and, what yes. they're, and they're training to evaluate what somebody's making an allegation of on paper, presumably. Presumably they don't talk to anybody when they make these decisions. Do they um, talk to anyone? Is it just a paper exercise that to determine they, whether... They do some things by paper, then sometimes, then they also we get in um, CAFCAS, you know, the Children Family uh, Advi Court Advisory and Support Service. They will do safeguarding and so their information will come in and then they may well have a hearing about it. And, and they often send it up to the district judges or the circuit judges but they're having to make those early decisions as to which direction the case is going. Um, and they are very difficult to make. There's no doubt about it. Yes. Because the consequences are so, yes. as they said in the judgment, you can limit a parent's involvement with a child or expose a child and parent to abuse if you get those case, those decisions that, yeah, wrong. It, it, absolutely. Yeah. It's terrifying to think you might get that wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you live with sort of making these incredibly important judgments? Because you're not dealing with some corporate claim where, you know, some company may have to pay something and no one's really going to, there's money and there's, you know, no one, no real effect on people's long term lives up to a point. <laughs> how, um, you know, there was the film, The Children Act, based on that, yes. about how you make these really hard decisions about people's lives that have, and you, you don't know what the effect was in the future. You know, you don't know what, what, what really happened in the end, I suppose, sometimes. Is it hard? I mean, I is it, do you just get used to thinking, I've got to get off the fence? just get and... used to it. I'm afraid it might sound callous, but generally you just get used to it. Be and, and because as soon as you finish you come up, you come upstairs, you've given this massive judgment, which has really taken it out of you. And you come upstairs and there's the file or nowadays it's more likely to be an e-file from the next day's case. So you just have to clear your mind and move on and get, prepare for the next case. So um, quite often you, you, you will, through the networks, hear what happened, sometimes anyhow. Um, usually, you know, so-and-so got a wonderful adoptive placement or that relationship with the dad's really going well. You, you, it's wonderful to hear. You don't enough, but you do occasionally. But as far as it doesn't tend to keep me awake or most of my colleagues awake at night because you've just got to get on with the next one. Mm. I mean, I think that's probably one of the differences between academics and legal practitioners, particularly judges. Not that we're kept up awake all night academics but hopefully we aren't but um we can sit on the fence you know academics can spend i've spent most of my career sitting on the fence as well <laughs> dreaming but i once wrote an article and you know the editor said come on danny it's about time you got off the fence what do you actually think and i said well i don't really know and that's fine as an academic up to a point in a way but of course the judge you really have to get off the fence you really do and very very occasionally somebody gets appointed who can't make a decision and okay. that's disastrous i mean very rarely because you know you you people get appointed who've already sat as deputies or recorders or whatever so they know what the job is but some people do find it decision making very very hard but most of us um that has to be one of the main strengths that you have because yes you you just have to and it's um most decisions, I would say, in my world, are not um, finely balanced. Um, 
the very, very occasional ones that are, they may keep me awake at night um, while I'm doing them. Maybe not after I've made the decision, but most of them aren't. Most of them are pretty clear cut. Right. And um, how much, I mean, in terms of making something clear cut, how crucial then is the role of expert opinions? Um, how persuasive are they? The social workers, or it could be the guardians, obviously, in a family, in, yes. in, in a private case. Do you often go against the expert judgment? No. Um, the guardian is the guardian is is there mainly in the care cases and it's usually the first document i read what the guardian says and um very rarely do i go against the guardian i can't even think the last time i do did but i mean i have done um experts um it, 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 that can be difficult if you have um, experts who don't agree but that again doesn't happen too often um Experts, if you're having a, a case where non-accidental injuries for a child, for example, um, we usually have jointly instructed experts on the bones or the um, burns or whatever it is. Um, and it's unusual to have conflicting evidence. So it's, it's generally you're going to accept that. Um, the psychological and psychiatric evidence uh, we do ha we, we're trying to cut down psychological evidence um, because we're hoping that the social workers can really tell us what we need to know um, because expert evidence is taking up a lot of time I'm right. afraid um, mm. social workers I think uh, Obviously, they have to be challenged, um, but generally, you're, you, I find you know they're honest, hardworking professionals. Um, but you, yes, you might disagree with them, but um, it's it's pretty important evidence. Yes. Yeah, I read the um, your guidance to social workers giving evidence in court. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I think you wrote that in essays quite some time ago. Yes. But yes. You go to this sense of don't take it as an offence when we ask you her searching questions that's our job you've got your job and we've got our job yes um it's i think you mentioned the fact that what's difficult is when they become over defensive absolutely yes um it's much better if they if they if they sometimes acknowledge yes the the I mean, for example in a typical case where they're advocating for the child to go for adoption they may well be things that the parents have done well or whatever, say it, acknowledge it. It mm. makes it much more of a balanced view and the court is more likely to think, well, this is a fair witness. Whereas if they can only put, give you the negatives. Yes, it, an argument it, it, that involves yeah. cherry picking is a bad yes. argument. I always can tell students that when they're writing essays, don't cherry pick your arguments. That yes. Tell me that, show me that you know the arguments on the other side. It yes. doesn't weaken your case, it makes it stronger. It does. De definitely with the social workers, I find that. Um, yes, I mean, I was very keen at the time to, to write that because I think social workers, um, I think it might have changed, but they were not properly being prepared to give evidence and they were found, a lot of them found it really scary and intimidating. Were they scared of you? You said that the That's advocates were scared of you, not of That's you. <laughs> no, that was a bit of a joke. But I mean, I think I don't think advocates would turn up late for my court unless they, you know, the, the train had been cancelled or whatever, right. because it's just not done. It's I think it's it's schooled into advocates at a very early age. Right, right. Too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, the one thing about I want to go back to the case because we are meandering, but I quite like yes. meandering in these conversations uh, in, in this re-HN case. Uh, one of the things that the Court of Appeal talk about is they refer to the harm panel. I mean, what's a couple of interesting things about that Court of Appeal case. First of all, there were lots of interveners. So I'm quite interested in this idea for everybody listening. An intervener is when in a, a Court of Appeal case or a higher case, um, you don't just have the applicants, you don't just have the, the parties, you get campaign groups and lobbyists. So in this case, which was a really important, one of the most important family law cases about uh, domestic abuse in the family courts, women's aid were involved, family needs fathers were involved, Association of Lawyers for Children were involved, Catholics, there were loads of policymakers, campaign groups, NGOs, 
all contributing to the court case. And I think that's really fascinating, that role of interveners. So that's one thing that's interesting about that case, just to emphasise how important it is. The other thing, and this is a stylistic point, which I don't like, I'm getting off the fence on this point. It's a joint judgment of the three judges. And I know that makes it easier for students because you just get one judgment to read. <laughs> but I like it when all the judges give an individual judgment and you get to see the personality of the judges in the case. Yes. What do you think about this tendency for joint judgments? Where does that come from? I, I really don't know. I don't think I've got anything I can contribute to that. Um, I, all I can guess is that it was seen as... Um, so important that it was seen to really strengthen what they were saying but i i, I don't know way above my level <laughs> right. yeah the case i think there's one case in the supreme court where that comes about as well it is a it is a trend i think something like that. we speak with one voice and i don't like that i think the common no. law different judges having different absolutely voices. no i agree yes no you're right you're right yes on different styles but mm -hmm. back to the actual content of the case they refer to one of the campaign groups and they refer to it very approvingly um no <laughs> not one of the interveners but a, a, a report that said that one of the problems in these family law cases is that it's an adversarial system and that fundamentally it's a systemic problem in resolving these very difficult private family law disputes, particularly where domestic abuse is raised, but even when it, it, it's not raised. They say the adversarial system is a barrier to moving forward there. And I remember, because um, I learned family law before the Children Act was introduced, just to date myself, you know, way back in the yes. early 80s, yes. when the Children Act was introduced in 1989, or rather, passed in 1989. Everybody was very excited because there were going to be no winners or losers. There was only going to be the best interest of the child. You must remember all that, the, you know, the the, okay. yeah. of the children act. don't have winners or losers, losers in cases involving children. But that hasn't happened. I mean, it is. So is there, how can we move be, beyond adversariality and this adversarial system in the family courts? unless you move to sort of a system where you just get you just get rid of the parties and you just in effect have an investigative approach you have a social worker you get your the judge makes the expert the judge has far more power you don't rely on two different people or three would have many parties making the case can we get beyond adversariality Oof. that's that's a that's a very difficult question, and I'm not sure I could answer it. I, I, I can't, I can't imagine doing it in any other way. I mean, the, the trouble if I was just if I was given the, all the papers that people had written stuff about that they're written their statements, and then they came in front of me without representatives, and I was just to ask them questions, for example, I don't think I'd get to the truth at all because I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what to ask. I wouldn't know what the backstories are, etc. Because unless they'd brilliantly written their statements in the first place, how would I know what what's going on? In, in the same way as when, under the current system, because um, somebody who is alleged to be a perpetrator isn't allowed to cross-examine the person alleged to be the victim, um, and so they're required to write down their questions for me to ask. Um, that's the current system. Um, I, those questions are nearly always completely useless. Um, and I try to ask better questions, but without really understanding what has happened in that relationship, I, I don't know the questions to ask. So I, I unless you had a, um, unless you had a, the Kafka officer with a lawyer really going and investigating each case, which would cost a fortune, I just can't see how it would work. So, I mean, I'd be very keen. I, I know they're trying something in these domestic violence um, pilot courts, but I, have, I haven't heard anything about how they're doing it. And I just haven't got the imagination to, to think how, how you could do it. Mm. I mean, I suppose adversariality always sounds bad in these cases, but actually the good side of it, it means you can, stand, you know, as a solicitor who was in practice, there is someone fighting your corner. Well, there is that. And the other thing is the, the, the key to these cases, if you can, is to get the, it's to make the child a party. Then they get a guardian who does that investigation, as in re-HN, mm. and they have a lawyer. 
And the questions that the law that lawyer usually asks at the end of the cross examination are usually the most important ones because they have they're they're instructed by the guardian who's made all the investigations. They've heard all the they've met all the people. They've done all that work, and and that in a way, I I think that works. But you only get that it's it's gold dust to get those. Um, cases and Kafkas haven't aren't resourced to do it in more than a tiny minority of cases but that's what works that's right. why when I did the rehearing on rehn I felt I confident that I got it right because um well not only because of that but be, it was a great help to have the the questions that were asked on behalf of the child right that's really interesting and I want to come on to that rehearing mm -hmm. case because the court of appeal in this case it was one of those cases where there are four cases, four appeals, four different women in totally different situations in four different cases had appealed to the Court of Appeal. And as happens sometimes in law, the Court of Appeal decided, well, they're all raised the similar issues of law. So let's put them all together. And that happened before in the domestic violence because in the LVMH case, which was yes. the other yes. groundbreaking case that was meant to yes. change everything. So um, you bring the Court of Appeal says, look, let's put all these different cases together and we'll present some sort of guidance in a way uh, uh, to all the courts. And then, of course, you then had to rehear a case, the Tolson case. You actually had to rehear one of those cases, yes. which I've had the pleasure of reading your judgment, which is quite a compelling read. And you um, found, clearly found in that case, the mother quite unconvinced. You weren't convinced clearly, very clearly not convinced by her evidence. Um, um, just a couple of questions about that case, and I'll be interested to hear what you can say about it as well. But two questions for me. What strikes me, and again, this is something the Court of Appeal talks about, is that you have to make quite a binary decision. It either is, there either is evidence of controlling and coercive behaviour, or there isn't. It can't be there might be, there might not be. So you have to, it's not guilty or not guilty, it's not criminal, but it is equally binary. Yes. And that notion of a yes. binary judgment is tough. And it does require a difference a distinguishing between emotional abuse, um, controlling coercive behavior on one hand, and on the other hand, deeply upsetting and distressful behavior on the other hand and on there they're clearly questions of fact for you based on evidence but it struck me that in a ways these aren't just factual questions they're also this this is me wearing the academic hat is that they're social value judgments as is clear from your you know decision in that divorce case it's about attitudes so what might be considered emotional abuse now as opposed to just, in inverted commas, deeply upsetting and distressful, that's going to shift in in five years, 10 years time with our what we accept, isn't it? So it's a yes. factual evidential question, but you are making a value judgment about behavior as well. And how do you involve that? How is, is that something that judges you discuss with the other judges about what sort of value judgment should we make? Is this acceptable now? Because it seems a really difficult line to draw between emotional abuse, fact, which then means we're going down that route in court and that form of fact finding, and this is the way you know it impacts on course manage a case management, or no, it's just and again inverted commas deeply upsetting and distressful behaviour. I, I, again, I don't know how you make those decisions. I think. I, I, I think probably subconsciously in some ways, because you are. I'm a member of society now. I know what I think is acceptable and not acceptable. And I think if I if my my views on, on those things were so out of kilter with where society is now, um, somebody would have told me by now. So I think I agree with you. What what is said now will probably not be what might be looked at in 10 years time and thought, well, how could they think that then? But I think it, it does reflect where we are now. Um, so, for example, coercive and controlling behaviour is very much that is the theme now. Um, yeah. So much so in, in, in the, the latest one, K, they more or less say that's that's got to be the priority. That's what we're interested in you identifying. Now, um, seven years ago, I don't think we were looking for it at all. 
Um, I'm not sure we we probably knew it if we saw it, but I don't think it was probably had a name to it. But so it, it does. It's 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 definitely evolving as society evolves. Now everybody knows what it is, I think. And, um, and, and really everybody is quoting is 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 alleging it. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I mean, once something and and, and just rightly so, it recognizes something yes. that's very, absolutely. very real. I mean, yes. it's real. It, it is absolutely really important, and it's you know, emotional harm is as important as yes. as physical harm. Sometimes far, far worse. Um, you mentioned that you reflect society's values. A bit. I wonder, and this is why I'm going to push you a bit. I wonder whether, in a sense, you sort of you can make society's values. You say no, society should think this because what's Society just doesn't have one value. You know what you think and what some conservative M conservative MP watching porn in the House of Commons thinks is acceptable. It's probably going to be slightly different. And yet you're both members of society. So you couldn't be. Quite... Yes. yes. I'm not going to say politically because I know you can't. No, no, be... I agree with you. I agree with you. But I think Active. probably Active. generally family judges are. Um... I like I do think we are quite um, um, I think we're quite aware of what's going on in society and what's right and what's wrong according to current uh, mores um, and you can imagine we were discussing the Tory MP <laughs> at lunchtime and yes not uh, not very impressed um, so and I think you're probably right. May it could well be that ReHN, which really talked about coercive and controlling behaviour, was I think part of what put it out there. And um, I don't. I mean, remember everybody was talking about the the archers, um, the relationship in the archers. Oh, I've it took me ages to get over that. That was. I know, well, I, I couldn't even listen to it. I found it so uh, yeah ghastly. But um, now I can't remember. And I would think that must have been just after ReHN. Um, and I think it, it, you can almost probably draw a line um, because it, I think the ReHN it became much talked about in the press, etc. The Archers then had their their story, and now it, everybody knows about it and it's recognised. And I think, I hope that it will mean that more women are aware of of that sort of behaviour towards them. Not only women, it, it happens in all sorts of relationships, um, and. Uh, they're more likely to get out of it, seek help and all the rest of it. I mm. hope so, because mm. it's so corrosive for them and for any children there. I mean, and just a note to everybody listening, The Archers is a long run radio <laughs> TV show. Thanks oh, God. dear, it's our age, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm addicted to The Archers, but anyway. Um, I often tell my students, uh, you really have to have one good soap in your life, whether it's the Arches or East End or Coronation Street, because it's really critical to the studying of law. If you take criminal law and family law out of most soaps, TV soaps, you really don't have any plots left. And it's quite fun to see how they get the law right or what social issue Yes. For vehicle of law, they're actually trying to take on quite an educative role. It was all Reethy and BBC yes. at its best, I thought, yes. in terms of that Archer's story. Absolutely. Like that. Absolutely. It was, I think it, it opened eyes and ears all over the country. I think it was fantastic. As a story in EastEnders has done, um, I do feel I have to keep a hand in there as well. <laughs> about um, stop and search of young black men. I mean, I think EastEnders really, really did a long storyline on that. And it's got a big adoption case as well and a surrogate case. EastEnders is basically a fad, covers the entire family law curriculum. <laughs> no, I'm it, afraid I haven't got into that yet, so. <laughs> I've got time for it. But anyway, um, I wonder if you wanted, there's other thing I wanted to say about your rehearing in the in in that case. There's a, there's a bit in your judgments and it just caught my eye. I really liked it where you talked about you're evaluating the evidence and not only do you talk about reading all their text messages and their emails and what counts as evidence, you know, just think that every text message is a form of evidence of you trying to determine not just honesty, but what's really going on there. But then there's a point in evidence and you say um, you're talking about the husband in that case and you say in your judgment, he smiled in an ironic way, not smug. And I thought this is a fascinating, a very honest acknowledgement of what you're doing as a judge you're actually reading their physical performance and I don't I can't remember a judge being that honest 
about what you're doing, that you're looking at the way they're smiling and trying to read whether it's a smug smile or what's going on. And we don't need to go into the individual facts about that yeah. husband and that, but it's about you you spend time looking at people. I think it's absolutely crucial. I, um, before I went to university, my mother sent me on a typing course because she thought, you know, it's always a good thing to have. You'll probably end up a secretary. So I went and I'm now the world's fastest typist, which and sight, I don't look at it. So it means that I'm looking at people all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm not looking down at papers or screens or anything. I'm looking at the people and it's crucial. I mean, there's lots of guidance about um, how you interpret all that and you have to be careful. But sometimes um, if, for example, I'm doing a I remember recently doing a, a, a case where the baby had been horribly battered and the mother said it was the father, the father said it was the mother. And when the father was giving evidence, I was watching the mother and it was absolutely clear she was not performing for me. But when he made some allegation, her her expression of complete horror that he could say such a thing, it, mm -hmm. it, it was genuine. And that helps me decide. I mean, obviously, I have to be aware is somebody performing for me, but... I think yeah. I can tell that. And right. they very they don't realise they know they're performing in the witness box. But when they're sitting behind their advocate watching the other person perform, they don't realise I'm watching them. And I find it very helpful. So you're looking at their response to what's yes. going on. Really interesting. Right. Not just what's yeah. going on in the witness yeah. box. Right. Yeah. So right. I, I do think you, you have to use all your skills. You, you need every and all your all the tools there and and um, watching people all the time being aware that different cultures etc can react in different ways you have to factor all that in mm. but you get a feel of, some of these days go on for five days you get a feel of how people react and you, you do have I, I find it very helpful and mm. I'm really glad my mother sent me on that typing course so you don't have to spend all the time yeah. looking down yeah, I don't do that I or writing it down as most of my colleagues do they need it all right by hand whereas I'm typing my evidence and I'm watching all the time. Right, right. Do you think the lawyers who, advocates who come to your court, do you think people are aware of that? I mean, you know, people, I know when I talk to advocates and you know, lawyers in courts, they'll have very strong views about different judges saying, well, you get to that judge, you'll get that judgment. You go there, you'll get that judgment. Um, what do you think they would say about you? Is that a really unfair question Ooh. to ask you? Sorry, that's probably a whole <laughs> unfair question. Um. I think they'd probably say um, you you um, <laughs> you can't get away with anything with her. I think that might be what they'd say. I I I, I think they'd say unfair, but I think they'd also say because um, because I will have read the papers, I will be listening um, and watching. <laughs> I think that's what they might say. <laughs> Well, I think that that would be a good a good thing if they did say that. Um, just quickly around the, the the case of that hearing, I mean, as I don't want to get into the details of the facts and that, but I wonder, are you optimistic that as a result of these judgments, things are going to change? Or what do you think will change around because of the decisions in re -NH in terms of the way in which the courts are going to deal with domestic abuse? Because it's been a huge issue. Lots of people have been quite upset about it. Um, what do you think will change as a result of those court cases? Um, judges are have all had extra training on it and some of them needed it. Mm. Um, they're all being and we're, I think the training will be ongoing about it. Um, I think people are are being more careful about how how they deal with these cases. And I think I think one of the important lessons in that case was the danger of getting bogged down in individual facts rather than take a step back and think, what was the experience of of being in that relationship like for that person and for the child in that family? And I think that's where some of my colleagues myself too probably had occasionally fallen down in getting too bogged down that was the danger of the schedules of allegations you got 
fixed on individual allegations and didn't look at the whole. So I think that has I think that has changed. I think people are much more likely to be looking at at the whole and um, the coercive and trolling aspect, I think people are much more aware of that than perhaps they were um, and can see it. Um, on the downside um, is the fact that there's so there's so much of this work that um, the, the backlogs are now quite unacceptable. What are what are, what can you have you got any evidence? What are what is the backlog? So a case made now. What I mean, it's really long. Is so this is a family law dispute. How long do they have to wait to get a? Well, a well if I was setting a case down now um, for a trial on, 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 and remember they will already have had some probably they may have started the whole thing maybe four months ago before they get to me. They may not get a hearing. Till the end of the year, a trial, and that is a long time. Yeah, that's a long time to have not knowing what's going to yeah. happen or something. And it's yeah. probably, and my court might be, that might be better than in some other courts. But um, the private law cases have gone through the roof in terms of numbers, and the numbers needing these fact-finding hearings. Mm, mm. So that. Um, that ha is not, I'm not saying it's a bad consequence of rehn, but it is a consequence of it. And of I, course, that also has consequences on other cases, which also then delay get delayed. I'm clutching at straws here, probably. But is there, and this is you know trying to find a silver lining, but is there a, a possibility that this delay, the backlog, could focus some parties' minds and lead to some form Ooh. of resolution thinking you know we we really shouldn't have to wait we're not going to wait this long let's um well let's just we want to get this resolved let's just um, try. well that's where this the, the, yes in, i think if we're if we're better at drilling down at in what is this going to make a difference in the long run to the relationship between the child and the other parent mm. and if it isn't do we have to go down that route um, so I think we're going to get better at doing that. Um, I, ha I had that this week where um, the parents both agreed that the other parent didn't need to be supervised with the parent with a child, but where um, the Kafka officer referring to pre allegations now in the past thought that the it was all unsafe, but mm. I heard it all and just in an hour's hearing and no it was it it was clear to me that the relationship between the children and the parents should go on without the need for supervision because those allegations did not need to be further investigated they were in the past both parents felt the other parent was safe with the children the parents themselves now lived apart they were not a threat to each other they hated each other but they weren't a threat to each other and so that was one of the ones where we're now it's it's about other issues in a way, not about. So so I'm hoping we can identify those cases where it is safe to not go down that path. Right. I just want to ask you a couple more general questions about judging before throwing it open yes. to anybody else. So could everybody else listening, if you can start writing your points mm -hmm. or questions in the chat, please do at the top of the screen, you'll see a little bubble with the word chat. If you can just type anything there, then I'll, I'll come to that and I'll, I'll read out any questions. So please get typing in the chat. Um, as a judge, uh, you obviously have the all judges can be appealed and overruled. Have you been what's uh, uh, um, overruled? What's it like when your judgments get appealed? Do you get nervous about it and think, God, am I going to get over? You do. Everybody will tell you not to, that, they, that they don't, but everybody does. Um, right. I mean, a, a very wise colleague once said to me when I was starting out, and they tend to appeal you when you're first appointed a lot, just to, to really sort of put you in your place, I think, and That's to test really you out. It that seems to seems to be what happens. And um, he said to me, another judge, if you're overturned, it means another judge took a different decision on a different day, probably on different facts by the time it got to him. So <coughs> relax. I've tried to do that. Um, 
I've I haven't been a, it's it's been pretty rare actually that I've been overturned. Um, but it, yes, you do feel sensitive about it. Is you do because it's somebody's marking your homework and you're getting a bad mark probably. So it's, 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 <laughs> that's what it feels like. Say that because when I read your judgment, I thought this and it was and I really like it. It's a great judgment to read. Um, there is a sense, and I think judges they like they show they're working. It's like a massive. You don't just say the eyes. How did you get there? Is really important. You know, I've read this. I've had regard to that judgment. I've looked at that. I've not read the evidence for this, but I have looked at that. And it's a real case of showing your workings. You ha you're talking about the re HN one again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I had to because I knew it would be appealed. Crossed eyes and teeth. Uh, yeah, I, think, yeah. I had to, and um, uh, I was very, very careful. Worked very hard, and permission to appeal was refused. Right. Yeah. I mean, where do you find the time? Because now you're in a man as the designated family judge, you're involved with a lot of management. As yes. well. What's your kind of balance between hearing care? Does that mean you have to, you can hear less cases? Yes, definitely. I don't tend to take on many long cases. I just don't have the time. There's so much management to do. It's crazy. But um, there, you don't think of judges managing, but there is an awful lot to do. So, okay. yeah, I don't do many. I don't do. I probably do a fifth of the cases that other people do, or something can, like that. Can you give us a quick sense about what management mean for a judge? What sort of management is there? Um, well, um, hmm. it can be anything from HR issues, judges who are off sick or having other difficulties, to um, uh, judges who aren't who who complains that the judgment isn't coming out. You know, the case is heard weeks ago. We haven't heard anything to um, deciding what whether I'm trying to decide at the moment uh, whether to abolish all the COVID um, changes we put in. For example, we still have some hearings um, on teams or, or the equivalent, whether to bring everybody back in. And, and then I have to negotiate that with um, our administrators and I have to factor in um, we can list more cases that way because we can't you can't do back to back cases. You can't cram the cases in when you're online because it takes so long to set it up and then you keep losing people and all the rest of it. So, you know, th th those sort of decisions, then um, I will have decision. I'll have meetings with I might have a meeting with the police to discuss disclosure, how to get information from the police better into our into our cases um and so it goes on i, I mean there's it's just endless <laughs> there's so much of it wow. and then it can be about uh, a new dishwasher which they've managed to buy for us which is um, doesn't take any plates <laughs> <laughs> so you know sublime to ridiculous yes right. well we've got some uh, questions in the chat now from um, yes. Karen, um is asking um that's good. How often and how detailed are the inquiries made to the children themselves to decide who they want to stay with? If it's a, obviously and that means, yeah. In a private law case. Yeah, um, that would be a case of a uh, child arrangements order yes. around the child's going to live. If um, if the parents are not in agreement, we would often ask Kafkas to investigate and they will meet the children um, really even if, even if they're pretty young, but they won't ask, a, say, a four year old, where do you want to live? They'll just get a sense of the four year old and and how they relate to their parents. Um, then they're good at not asking questions as bluntly as that, but they'll do drawings and things with the children. So um, I would think from about 10, you, you, you might be a bit more um, straightforward in asking your questions. Pre-COVID, we always had a scheme at, at my court that um, children came along to the first appointments um, and the Kafka officer interviewed the children. And the number of times that what the child said was the most sensible thing you heard that day and sorted out the case. That's right. one of the things I want to bring back now post post-COVID, but we haven't quite got there yet. Right, right. That's, I mean, that follows on to the next question, which is from Teresa. Thank you. Saying, at what age does the child really have a voice in a family court? Mm -hmm. um, and it struck me as well that um, why do magistrates never hear the child, even when they're dealing with these decisions? 
Uh, well, they would they would hear the child in the same way uh, through the guardian or the Catholic yes. officer. Um, so, and I mean, sometimes sometimes children attend. For example, um, the, the, those difficult cases where um, the local authority may be applying for a secure accommodation order. So a child who is really um, quite often now it's sub at risk of being involved in county lines or gangs or child sexual exploitation, They're, they want to lock them up. And then the children themselves, their teenagers, will attend if they want to, and I, I will hear from them. Right. Um, uh, and it can be that can be quite upsetting if you have to then, dis they're pleading with you not to lock them up, but you feel you have to. So we yeah. do listen to children, um, but it's mainly for younger children, it's through the guardian who will talk to them. Right. Spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. And social workers too. So I think we, we 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 do, but we try and protect them from actually coming to court on the whole. And I, I tend to think that's right. Right. Um, yeah, I know it's a huge debate in the academic literature about, you know, in the child voice involved in the child. And there's quite a lot of rhetoric, isn't it, about the child voice? It's, it's, yes. it's, yeah, it's complicated. Um, Trace, I'm going to move on to look at some other questions, but we'll come back to asking your other questions, which look like wonderful exam questions. I might use them in my my course, actually. But <laughs> Sonia, thanks for your question. You're saying, so this is Sonia's question, um, Judge. I'm torn about taking up family law. I feel like I could be good at it, but I also believe that that will be emotionally charging. I am a mature student. I probably do not have time to experiment. Mm -hmm. I know you will get used to it, but how did you manage the emotional side of your role at the beginning of your career? I might be a hard cow, but I don't remember it as being, I don't remember it as really ch ch troubling me in that way, because you've got a job to do in a way, in a way, like I suppose like a doctor. Um, you've got this you, your role. It, you're of no use to anybody if you if you mm. put your arm around the person and just sob with them. You've got a job to do, um, and you're you're taken up with that. I don't think you'll I don't think you'll find it um, so emotionally upsetting because you're using your training, your brains, your skills in sorting that out. Um, so. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. If if you feel it, if you if you feel you'd be good at it, go for it. I'd say, I, it's never boring, never. And I think a mature student, I was slightly mature, um, and I think you bring a lot. We need people in family law who are um, who have other experiences. I think and who are older. Mm. And actually, if anybody just wants to apply to be a family magistrate, there's a call gone out oh, recently. Yeah encourage people to be family magistrates at the moment and you can all do that straight away. Um, there's a question here from Hyde, well, there's an email address, I'm not sure what the actual name is. Are, are divorce hearings more difficult due to the increase in litigants in person, especially when one is a lip litigant in person? Yeah. And what rep oh, Lenia, yes, sorry, Len. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, uh, I, yes, litigants in person where it's unequal on either side. That's not fair, is it? Well, the divorce hearings, I think you probably mean that uh, the, the divorce hearings we tend to have are the financial hearings. Um, yeah, not the actual um, itself. Yeah, and yeah. Um, every every hearing where with litigants in person are really difficult for they're difficult for them. I think they must they don't generally understand what's going on. And I don't think we're very good at telling them and partly because we just don't have the time or the patience, which I regret. Um, and I think in all my many years now of doing this, over 20 years, I've only had one litigant in person who I felt represented himself well, which is an awful thought because they don't know what's relevant. Mm. They don't know what to prepare. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know the law. They don't say, uh, no, it, it's, it's very difficult. And if one is represented in the other, in a way that's better. I think as lawyers, as judges, um, we're desperately desperate to have any lawyer in there. So it, it, it actually is better if there's a lawyer in there um, because you can then focus on assisting is probably the wrong word, but in some way assisting the litigant in person rather than try, trying to help both put their cases across is almost impossible. So I would prefer it to have at least one lawyer in there. I was um, 
always struck when I remembered that it was uh, when legal aid was introduced just after the war alongside the setting up of the NHS, the Legal Aid Act from 1948 or nine, I can't quite remember the exact year, but it's late 1940s legislation. The main reason it was set up was for family law. And 90 percent of legal aid cases were for family law, all those ex-servicemen getting divorced, coming back into the country and they set up legal aid for it. So the theory was, wasn't it, that sort of we'd get rid of legal aid for these cases. Therefore, you would save lots of money. But then in practice, it takes you longer in the court case. And they might if they'd had a bit of legal aid, they might not have ended up in court because they get an hour with a lawyer saying you haven't got a hope in hell. Don't do this. Don't do that. Save more time, wouldn't it? But you completely, absolutely. Couldn't yeah. put it better myself, yes. Well, and I did read one of your cases in the Legal Aid case where you were not critical of the Legal Aid Advice Board, well, a little bit critical around the translation case, but that was, yeah, very, very, I, I liked that. was where I thought you were really on the side of access to justice, very clearly. Um, Theresa, you're saying, do you believe a family court judge should be a parent themselves? Oh, that's an interesting question. Absolutely not. Um, some of my best judges are gay and don't have children or just don't have children. So no, um, it's a matter, you need to be a, the expression I think is a mensch, you need to be a, <laughs> you need to be a, a person who understands other people and has some life experiences. Uh, I think um, you certainly don't need to be a parent, no. Um, I suppose everybody's yeah. being a child themselves as well. So the yes. things, things through yes. in ways. Um, and I wonder, but just time for a, I've got to, I'm going to come in with a final question. Um, quick question back to Therese again. You asked, is, oh, is there another question coming? Oh, Deborah <coughs> is asking, have you ever dealt with a case on child trafficking for sexual exploitation? And also, what would you say about the youth justice system in the UK? Well, that's a very big second question. But uh, um, yeah, uh, over to you, Judge. Yes, you well, on the first question, yes. Um, it, it, there's, there's, there's a lot of it about, I've done international ones um, and um, within this country ones, and they're, they're very distressing and they're very hard to pin down quite often. Um, I was giving advice to a, a colleague on one yesterday. Um, there's a lot of it. Um, so um, as to the youth justice system, I, I, I don't think I'm qualified to say because that's that's crime really. So I, I, I haven't done it, not for, over 20 years, so I don't think I could say anything sensible about the youth justice system. Um, it is interesting how the system, lawyers and statutes and professionals, we sort of divide things up into categories, which yes. from real life perspectives might not be the case. I remember I was involved in a case where the young boy in the case was excluded from school, which was education law. He was <laughs> subject to a youth justice case. He was all in, also involved in a child protection case. Um, this was just his life. And there was a housing law issue going on as well. And um, for him, this was just his life. He, you know, he was excluded from school. He'd done something wrong and the police were involved. And there was, a, you know, he was his family were homeless. And there was some child protection concerns from the social worker. Well, all the different professionals divided all of these things up. Um, and often that's, that's quite tricky from actual it is. real people's experiences, I think. It is. And uh, another example is um, going back to the, ch the children, the very, very vulnerable teenagers, usually teenagers who need to be locked up for their own safety. There are virtually no places. Mm. Um, there's probably, I think there's always about 50 children chasing every place in, in, in the family law world um, in, in any of these units. But if they can, if they get a criminal... Um, conviction there will always be a place because they these all these places hold places for children coming in through the criminal system so oh. we've actually been in the situation of hoping that this young person will get a get a sentence um to, to, for their own protection especially if they're in gangs or or county lines and that's ridiculous but we desperately need more places for them yes, there's a very famous judgment from the previous president of the family called um Sir james mumby and he got lots of publicity. I remember he was basically saying to the local authority, you find a place for this person, otherwise the system will have blood on its hands. It was an extraordinary judgment. But 
I think they did find a few, but yeah, yes. it's really hard, isn't it? Well, sometimes we send them up to the High Court just because um, we know that they'll, they'll, they'll get the publicity and they'll get the placement, but it's desperate out there at the moment for these teenagers. Oh, that's really interesting what you said, to get the publicity. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting role of, in terms of the legal system. OK, well, thank you so much for all those questions. That's great. I'm going to bring the... Uh, evening to a close by asking what is always our final question to participants in our legal practice conversation series. It's a bit like Desert, uh, Desert Island Discs this, they're allowed to choose one, <laughs> thing, but it's not a special thing then, you're not going to a desert island. But we do ask you to say you're, you're a lawmaker and you can do whatever you want, you can introduce a new law, you have all power, Judge, what would it be? You can do one thing, what would it be? Well, I suppose um, an academic kind of answer would be to identify there's a real problem with cohabitation and women particularly who coming out of those relationships and find that they have very little redress in law. So that's that I, I could give you that answer, but actually the answer I want to give you is going back to what we've talked about a lot, and it is I would bring back legal aid for mainly parents or any people going through private law proceedings because um, it, it, it will, it, it's desperate out there at the moment. There are all these people who are not able to understand what the legal sit situation is that they're in. And they're not able to present their cases. It's clogging up the courts so that, whereas we all know if they had, as you said, that hour with a sensible lawyer, they could some cases would never start and then the two lawyers one for each parent would talk to each other and sort it out and we'd never get to court that's what we used to do and at the moment we we've got all these cases coming to court which really don't need to be there and those that do need to be there they could be much better resolved better resolved and more fairly resolved and i'd sleep happier knowing that we've administered justice if i've if i've had lawyers on both sides yeah, thank you for that. Um, and that's a great call to everybody listening who's studying law. You know that law really makes a difference. Lawyers make a difference. They really oh, they do. They absolutely do. And I, I, I mean, I, I'm very, I'm particularly keen at the fact that you're you're teaching people who are more mature, have got other experience, and there's, and also I, I presume you've got lots of people from say, um, ethnic minority backgrounds, and we need all those people coming into the law. Um, and I, 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 I really would encourage you. It's a fantastic career. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know there's another question, but we're just going to end now. Um, thank you so much. That's been really, really interesting. And I really want to thank you on behalf of all of us for giving up your Friday evening. Uh, that's really much appreciated. It's been great listening to you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you. And Thank, look you. Thank you. Inviting you to work back in person sometime. 